to step back on when you still sign for me to come back. All right. Thanks again. Praise the Lord, everybody. Okay, wait a minute. Praise the Lord. Amen. I know you can make some noise because I heard everybody singing and clapping. Let's give the Lord a shout of praise. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Yes, okay. Now that we have that straight. I'm a, bra I'm a Baptist preacher. Some of you probably came from a Baptist church once upon a time. And that's okay. <laughs> but if you talk to me, I promise you I won't be up here long. I need a timekeeper. Yes, ma'am. Would you be my timekeeper? Fifteen minutes. Okay. Is that a deal? It's not that I'm trying to rush God, but I'm going to be obedient to his call and to his word. It's a great honor to be here. A great honor to be here, not because of anything that I've done, but because what God is doing through me and what God is doing through your pastor, your lead pastor. That's important because the rest of us, I'm not a lead pastor, I'm an associate, so I have to line up behind what my pastor does. And I also get to encourage him and talk with him whenever he may be troubled or needs an ear. Not all the time we have to say things, but it's good to have someone who seeks God first. And I believe that your pastor seeks God first. Or I wouldn't be up here because I don't go into territory that's not blessed, that's not anointed that doesn't welcome me with the spirit of Christ. Amen? Amen. So this morning, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about heart check. Heart check. What's on the inside? Won't you pray with me? All wise and gracious Heavenly Father, we just come at this hour just to say thank you, God. Thank you for this opportunity to share your word with your people. Father, I ask that you would put Pearl aside so that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart will be acceptable in your sight. Father, we ask that you would bless the people who will receive the word and that it will go out and not return to you void. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. You know... When I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me, my soul cries out, hallelujah. I thank God for saving me. For no matter what people say about you, no matter what good things they say, no matter what good works you do, if you have not been redeemed by the blood of the lamb, then all your work is in vain. Amen? So having said that, I know I'm working with some redeemed people in here. And I don't have to be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because you know it. Amen? You've been taught it. And you've received it. So even though I can't see every face, I stood in the back of the room. And I watched the, the seats fill up. And I said, Lord. This is the early morning service. I said, that's okay. I'm ready. And when I walked in, you know, it's rare when the pastor comes all the way out to the street to meet you, to greet you. That's the kind of pastor you have. He came out to the street to meet me. And sometimes when you're on your way to do what God has called you to do, the enemy gets in your path. So I had every light from Dallas to Belmont. <laughs> every light. I left home at um, 8.40. And I pulled up here at 9.20. It doesn't take that long to go 11 miles. 
So I knew that there was something that God really wanted me to do when I got here today. And I said, Lord, I'm yours. The musicians today set the tone for this. Oh, it blessed my soul. I was over here jumping <laughs> till I broke a sweat. And um, I said, well, you know what? It's good to sweat for the Lord, too. So this morning, you know, I want to bless the Lord. My favorite scripture is Psalm 34, 1, I will bless the Lord at all times. You know that scripture? And his words shall continually be in my mouth. Yes. I want to give some honor this morning to your pastor and his lovely wife and mom and all of you in the congregation. Back home, they're missing me, and my pastor always tells me when I go out, don't get lost. <laughs> so this morning, as we look at God's word, starting with Samuel 16, 7. And it reads, but the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on his height or the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as a man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And a lot of times when we hear that scripture, we think about the heart that beats in the chest. How many of you know that's not what God's talking about? He's not talking about flesh and blood. He's talking about our soul. That's the heart of every Christian. The soul. So he wants us to not look at color, at clothing, at hair. That's outward. That's outward. It can change in a moment in a twinkling of an eye. I had a dear friend who was barbecuing. And we were teenagers and she, the flames were not as hot as they, that she wanted them to be. You know, when you're 17, you know everything, right? And she, she was a beautiful young girl. You know, when you're 17, you know, you think you're all that in a bag of chips, too. I know I did, <laughs> you know? And so she decided that she would go out and put a little more lighter fluid on the charcoals. You know how it just powders down? So that's what she did. And when she squirted the lighter fluid, a big blaze came up. And the blaze followed the trail of the lighter fluid all the way up her arm she was burned over 90% of her body. But she was still my friend. It didn't matter. She was horribly disfigured. But the same person that I loved and played with and went places with before the fire, I took her with me after the fire. How many of you have been through something and you lose your friends? Okay. And then you're saying, God, why? This is what's happening in the world today. We're looking at the outer appearance. We're not looking at the soul. We're looking at the outer appearance. We're talking about things that happened in the past. We want to get revenge, restitution. None of those things God said that we should seek. He said, we should love ye one another as I have loved you. And when we do that, we don't meet strangers. When I walked in the back, there were some gentlemen back there in the back. 
and as I walked in, I gave them high fives. That's how I am. You don't meet strangers. You meet brothers and sisters in Christ. And if you're not saved, you pray that person through. Because you have to show your soul to them so that they will understand that this is bigger, greater than anything they've ever experienced. So let's make sure that God sees your heart, that he's in your soul, that he's in every fiber of your being. Amen? Yes. Don't be afraid. Right now we're living in a time when people don't talk to one another. People walk past other church members. And I know that doesn't happen here. We'll talk about the church down the street around the corner. Okay? Those people over there in that church walk past one another. But the church that Christ is looking for is one that has an open heart. That they know they've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. That the price that was paid for our salvation and our redemption was the life of Jesus Christ and his shed blood. So when we talk about diversity, people try to twist it around. Have you heard some of that? They try to twist it around and make it something ugly. Well, I grew up in Dallas. I, Dallas, back in the 60s and 70s, a little small town. You knew just about everyone. Or you knew of the family, and they knew of your family. When you have 2,000 people, it wasn't a booming metropolis. So there were people that you grew up with. There were people that you went to school with. Schools were integrated when I was in the fifth grade. And I went to car school. There were five black students in the whole school, and I was one of five, and I was in the fifth grade. And I was afraid, even though car school was right up the street from my home. I'd lived there all my life. My parents moved there. They got married in 1949, bought a two-room house, moved it onto a piece of property, a couple of acres of land right down below car school. And my father was a master carpenter, so he built a home for us. Not a house, but a home. And most of my friends in the community were white. And what hurt me the most was when I got to car school, they wouldn't talk to me. They had been eating at the table with me, playing in my yard, riding my bicycle, all of that. But when we got to the school, they turned their backs on me. And it hurt. But my father was a Baptist deacon he was a man full of wisdom, godly wisdom. And he said, treat them like you want to be treated. Talk to them. They're scared too. Because they don't want their friends to come against them. So they'll wait until it's after school time. And they'll come to the house and play. Well, I was 10 years old. I didn't understand that. So when they came to my house, I said, go home. You don't live here. You don't speak to me at school. You're not going to come to my house, and I'm not going to play with you. Somebody say, thank God for growth and deliverance. <laughs> because if I were that way now, what a shame it would be. I wouldn't be standing here. I wouldn't be one of the called. Listen to this scripture about diversity. It reads... Here to it. See, it's always good to have your notes. Because <laughs> you get up here and you think you're going to remember it, and then you forget it. Um, have you had your, your heart checked today? Did you do that this morning when you got up? Did you check? 
Did you say thank you, God, for waking me up this morning? This is what my mother used to say every morning as she woke up. She said, thank you, God, for waking me up this morning and starting me on my way, giving me an activity of my limbs, having a sound mind and a mind to serve you. Thank you for my children. Thank you for my husband. Thank you for my trials and tribulations because you brought me through it. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to save my sin-sick soul. And all that I am and all that I hope to be, I give you the praise. So when you wake up every morning hearing that type of affirmation, you realize that it's not all about you. And I was spoiled rotten. You hear me? I'm the only girl. I had four brothers. And I knew I was the, the princess in the house because my mother was the queen. The boys didn't have a title. They, they were just the boys. So now I stand before you, a woman of God, and called by God. So let's, let's take a look at this scripture. This is Psalm 9610. And it reads. Say among the nations. Jehovah reigneth. Yea the world is established. It shall not be moved. He will execute judgment. Upon the people. With equity. Among the peoples, he made it plural. So all of this stuff that people say, this race is dominant, that race is inferior, that race is, you know, mathematically inclined. You know, we, these stereotypes that we hear and perpetuate are not supported in the word. It's not supported in the word. So we have to check our hearts to see what we're saying. God didn't make any junk. He made all of us. And people are shocked when they go back in their ancestry, you know, do the DNA and find out that there's Scandinavian in a person who looks like me. I don't know how I got there. But God knew it was there all along. He made me. He, knew, he knows all about me. Doesn't he know all about you? Yes. So when we walk out and we see people who look different from us, say hello. God bless you. Don't harbor hatred in your soul. Because hatred will not go into the kingdom of God. Amen? So our diversity is how God intended for us to be. When I look over this congregation, there's diversity in the house. Somebody say amen. amen. How am I doing, sister? Okay. Two more minutes? All righty. So we have to live by the golden rule. We must live by the golden rule. And lastly, I ask you these questions. When was the last time you broke bread with someone who wasn't a part of your family or who didn't look like you? When was the last time you had a conversation with someone who didn't look like you? When was the last time you gave something to someone who didn't look like you, but you felt within your very soul that they needed something? And God had laid it upon your heart to go and bless that person. Every ministry here that you go out into the community, that's the spirit that you have to go out with. You never know who you're going to meet. You never know who you're going to see. And we're all family, amen? So we have to be inclusive of the family. People say equity is the same as equality. No, it's not. I learned this a long time ago. Growing up, I was an only girl. So the things that 
my parents did for me, they didn't do for the boys. They would say, that's not fair. So it wasn't equal, but the things that they did for the boys, they didn't do for me. I didn't play football, but I played basketball. So I didn't need cleats. I needed basketball shoes, right? high tops. I needed those. I needed track shoes because I ran track. I didn't need a piano because I wouldn't sit still long enough to learn how to play. <laughs> but my brother, one of my brothers, my second brother, he's a beautiful musician. So they, equality is giving people the same thing. Okay? If I have a house, why would you want to give me a second house? Well, everybody else gets a house. You know how Oprah does it? You get a car, you get a car, you get a car. <laughs> Think, maybe I don't need a car. Maybe I need clothes. Maybe I need new appliances. So one size doesn't fit all, right? But equity is giving people what they need in order for them to be able to thrive. There's a, there's a picture of three people standing at a fence. One guy is tall and he's looking out at the ball game. Another person is short and he's right here, the fence is hitting him like right here. The other person is in a wheelchair. It's impossible to see over the fence. So on one side, it gives, it shows giving every person a box. Well, the tall guy didn't need a box. The medium-sized guy, that was the right fit for him, and the person in a wheelchair couldn't get the wheelchair up on the box. But equality is the person who is tall enough to see over the fence doesn't need a box. He's okay. The short person needs one box, and the person in the wheelchair needed a ramp. So it, it meets you at the point of your need. Isn't that just like God? He meets us at the point of our need, and he gives us what we have prayed and asked for. Now, he may not give it immediately to us, but he is faithful. He's not a man that he should lie. So everything that God does for us is what we need. It's equitable, meaning he gives us what we need in order to do the things that he wants us to do, and he meets us at the point of our need. Amen? As I conclude, there's an old African proverb that says, when spider webs unite, they can tie up a lion. The little things that we tend to ignore helps us along the way to see the marvelous light that God intends for us to see and for others to see it in us, through us. As we walk this world, wherever we go, the people who look at you, you may be the only Christ that they will ever see. Have you had your heart checked today? Do you know where your soul is going? Do you know for sure that heaven is going to be your home. If you don't know that, then your pastor comes back up here in just a few minutes. I don't know how he does it. We have people come down. He might do it differently, but I'm going to let him do that. But the invitation is already offered to you. Don't leave here today without examining your soul and knowing for sure that regardless of diversity, equity, and inclusion, regardless of what people say about what's going on in the United States today, make sure your hand is in the master's hand. Don't leave here uncovered because we don't know the day nor the hour 
that our God will crack the sky. He wants us to be ready. Are you ready? Are you ready? Let the church say amen. Let the church say amen. God bless you. This is my little sister right here. She's going to go get some water. So I'm going to ask you to understand something from the perspective of a white guy. One of the things that we need to admit is that there is still a long way to go in the way that we treat one another. But what you said to us today is to look at the heart and check your heart. What you said to us today is that when we have an opportunity to be equitable, we should take the initiative to help the future be equitable. And that if we tie together like spider's webs, then we ultimately can tie up a lion. There's a lion that's roaring in our world today, and he wants to destroy it. But you know, one of the things that I love about Pearl is that she's decided to come and take the initiative. She was asked to serve on the county commission. She uh, became a Republican to be on the county commission. And ultimately, because of that, she got reelected when the African-American churches decided to change their voting status independently, one and all, from Democrat to independent, so they could vote her back into office. They had to find a status and a way to make it equitable. I just want to tell you one of the things. This is not Pearl talking. This is Ray talking. It is time for us as a world to understand and look at facts for the way facts really are. When you hear things like structural racism and critical race theory and diversity, equity, and inclusion, we need not to pay too little attention to that nor too much. We need to pay the right amount of attention to that. There's structural racism in our culture today. There still is. It doesn't mean that when cops or police officers are taught to pull people over in traffic. They say, you need to pull over 20 black people for every one white white person you do. But Darrell Robinson, who preaches on the stage over the years because he works for the government, he has to leave in the middle of the night, he's been pulled over 20 different times because he's a black guy driving a car in the middle of the night, a nice car with a government tag on it. I've been pulled over one time when I didn't deserve it. (laughs) That's an example, y'all. I mean, that's an example. This... I'm going to say one more thing, and then we're going to move forward and asking uh, Pearl. The first question I'm going to ask you in just a moment is, so what's happening in our county, and what are you doing to help us to become diverse, inclusive, and equity? The first thing is she's willing to come here and do this on Sunday. That's pretty powerful. So I want to thank you so much for coming. But, but the thing I want to say very much is that we should use the kind of vehicles that we have in our life to make a difference in our culture. We should be able to take our jobs and our positions in our community, I work with Habitat for Humanity on the board, and we have begun this uh, new project ever called Dixon Village, where 22 homes are going to be built. Um, many for people that are going to take advantage of minority discounts with, uh, or equity discounts that we have with Habitat. But there is a whole movement against having that community there, even though some of those houses are going to be sold to white people, because we heard things like this. We know those people don't know how to drive. That's a racism that's a culture in our culture. And we think nothing of it. Instead, let's, let's admit our blind spots. Let's admit where we've done things wrong and understand that that has nothing to do with Jesus Christ. This is Ray speaking. This is not Pearl speaking as well. We have nine white Anglo-Saxon Protestant or one Catholic county commissioners. They're all Republicans. I'm a Republican. Pearl's a Republican. But the fact that there is not a person of color consistently representing people of color in our county is wrong. And I, this is not Pearl talking, this is Ray talking, I'm going to do something to change it as a Republican and as your pastor. If you choose to to leave because of that, then there's lots of great churches out there. Delta is ready when you are, and don't let the backward door hit you or the good Lord split you. But if you want to be part of making a difference in our room, treat somebody else the way you want to be treated. Seek to make a difference in the world in which we live. And be like Pearl. So Pearl asked this question quickly. We're, we're going to ask a couple questions, and then we're going to have communion, and we're going to go home. So the first one is, so, so what are some, how do we move forward from here with all this nastiness and culture? What, what, how do, what are some of the ways we can move forward? Well, let me just share with you some of the things. I've been in this position since the 24th of August last year, so just shy of a year. Let me just share some of the things that we have done during this time. And it's been amazing. The first thing was to form a multicultural affairs committee. I call it the MAC team. 
The MAC team it consists of males, females, white people, black people, Asian people, uh, Latino, Latinx people, you know, people who have um, gender differences. And I know how we feel about some things, but I don't know how we, and I'm, when I'm saying we, all of us, feel about everything. But God said, let the wheat grow with the tear. This was an example. This was a parable that he gave us. And he would separate them when he comes. Amen. So if there's someone who is not with you or doesn't act the way you act and you think that they need Jesus, pray for them. Judge, don't judge them because God's going to do that when he comes. Amen. And we want to be like him because we are made in his likeness and in his image, correct? Amen. Amen. So in, or, in order for us to be like him, we have to follow his word and his guidance. Yeah. So here are a few things that we've done. We've taken that MAC team and we've gotten education. We, some of them wanted to do this work, but none of them had been through a formal training course. So we enrolled in uh, DEI in the workplace certification program through the University of South Florida. 14 people got their certification, a seven-week uh, course, and guess what, y'all? It was free. Amen. God made a way. Amen. Because I was already told, well, we don't have any money to do any education. Well, you can't go into a new effort without being educated, right. without understanding what this is, because the confusion out there, which is orchestrated by the enemy, who wants to sift us like we destroy our every everything about us that's right. has already confused the narrative. That's right. So people think that it's a it's a a, a minority only program. Uh, it's a Black Lives Matters program. It's a, some people said it was a Blue Lives Matters program, but it's not. It's for each person to do what we talked about, what I talked about in the sermon, to examine your own self. Amen to get rid of your own biases because we all have them. Amen. And to do, as Christians, what God has charged us to do. Amen. Love ye one another. So that helped us move forward. Uh, we've, we've recognized uh, individuals working in Gaston County uh, during various months, whether it was Black History Month, Women's History Month, uh, Latino History Month. Amen. We're recognizing people. You can't see people if you don't recognize them. That's right. So we, we're putting that, I don't see color, to bed. That's because right. if you don't see color, everybody would be in here looking pretty shabby right now. That's right. Because you have some different colors matched up that just wouldn't go. Amen. So not seeing color is not a compliment. See my color, but don't let it hinder you. And that's what we're teaching across 